Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good afternoon, everyone. It is Wednesday, February the 14th, 2024. It is currently 3.27 p.m. Central Time, and I am coming to you live from the Theology Central studio located right here in Abilene, Texas, where, well, right behind me, there's a window, right? It's, it overlooks my front yard, right? It's it's in the se- second story room here. That's where the studio is located. And right behind me, the school bus has just pulled up. It's letting out all of the juvenile delinquents. I mean, all of the children are getting yeah, I'm joking. They're not juvenile delinquents. Well, at least I don't think they are. And they're all getting out. I hear them talking and playing and Someone has a basketball, I can hear. Someone has a basketball out there. But that's what's going on here in West Texas. It's like 70-something degrees outside. So the kids are playing. They're out of school. Don't you remember how fun that was when you got out of school? How great it was? It was great. Wouldn't it be great if every part of life was like getting out of school, right? Getting out. Remember remember the last day of school before summer vacation? Remember how perfect it was? Wouldn't it be great if life was perfect in every single way, right? Every day felt like that. But you know, and I know that life doesn't work that way, right? There's difficulties that come at us from every, every corner. Some days there's good days. Some days there's bad days. You never know what's going on. You never know what you're going to experience when you wake up. But the one thing that you do know you're going to experience, the one thing you do know you're going to experience, I'm going to say it's a dogmatic certainty. It is more certain than death and taxes. Okay, well, well, those are pretty certain as well. It is certain. And you know what that certainty is? You are going to sin. I know that many Christians don't want to say that or believe that. They want to believe, no, 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 no. When I became a Christian, I'm a new creature. The old is gone. Everything is new. Well, then you shouldn't be sinning. Well, I mean, I'm new and everything is, uh, the old is gone and everything is new, but I, I, I'm still, I'm still going to sin. Well, that doesn't make any sense. So that means we have to understand that I'm new. The old is gone and everything is new. I'm a new creature. The old is gone. Everything is new in Christ, in my positional standing, because my practical standing, I'm just the same old sinner, right? But so I know, but Christians want to say, we've been set free from sin. Okay, well, I've been set free from sin. Can I be perfect? Well, no. What's keeping me from perfect? Well, sin. Well, then I'm not set free from it. I am set free positionally, not practically. But the reality is whether you like it or not, you're going to sin and I'm going to sin. You probably sin today. I've sinned today. Sin happens. It happens. And so it's it's a reality. It's a reality. And because it's a reality, well, then at least spiritually speaking, at least theologically speaking, and not every day, <laughs> and we never have that day where we feel like we just got out of school and we and and it's we just got released for summer vacation. It doesn't it doesn't ever feel that way because I know no matter how great I can feel right now, I'm like, oh man, I'm doing so good spiritually. Five minutes from now. 10 minutes from now, during this broadcast, sin will manifest itself in thought, word, feeling, desire. It will be there. Now you can be like, wow, you, you've got lots of spiritual problems. Well, the fact that you don't realize you have the same ones is problematic. So we have been talking a little bit about sin. We did a kind of a mini series. We did two parts. Maybe I should have done three parts. It, it got a lot of uh, traction. Uh, that's one of the probably, at least as far as 2024 is concerned, that's been the, the, the series that's garnered the most feedback. And we talked about succeeding against sin, how to succeed against sin. And that's from uh, Make a Difference, Making a Difference podcast from Sword of the Lord. Uh, They did a three part, they did three parts. We did two parts reviewing their audio. And so, and we never really figured out how we're supposed to succeed against sin. They never really, they didn't even really, and we really didn't get any answers. Now I know how to succeed against sin ultimately, and that is in Christ Jesus positionally. I don't know how to succeed against sin practically because I have a sinful nature. Therefore, I'm still going to sin. 
So then how do I measure success? Well, then I measure success over one sin. But the Bible says if I'm guilty in one point of the law, I'm guilty of all of it. So even if I'm victorious over one, now I do understand the practical implications, right? If you can avoid certain sins practically, well, then you you can avoid the practical ramifications that may come from said sin, right? If I can avoid drunkenness, well, then I can avoid all of the negative consequences that come from drunkenness. If I can avoid committing crime, I can avoid all the ne- so that like there's clearly practical benefits. But even if I'm avoiding drunkenness and even if I'm avoiding crime, I'm still a sinner and there still be sin will manifest itself in my life. So we've been talking about it. It's been an ongoing thing. It's been an ongoing situation. So guess what we're going to do right now? Well, earlier today, I was looking at the Sermons 2.0 app, right? We talked about this in the last live broadcast, and I noticed a broadcast was going on. And that broadcast was five tools to kill your sin part two. And I'm like, ooh, I've got to hear this. So I'm like, if that's part two, I've got to find part one. So I found part one, five tools to kill your sin. You can find it on the Sermons 2.0 app. Please look it up. Please download it. Please download it. Please, 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 please. So this fits perfectly with our Sermons 2.0 app challenge. I know we're supposed to be in the Minor Prophets, uh, but, you know, talking about sin today fits perfectly because we also are supposed to be talking about the historical uh, liturgical uh, calendar and the lectionary. And today is Ash Wednesday, where the the scriptures talk about sin. If we were to look up the the lectionary readings for today, sin, we, we are about repentance and sin. So it still all fits together. So what we're going to do is we're going to start listening to this. It's 44 minutes. There's no way we're going to get very far. We're not going to get very far, but we're going to start this. I don't know how many uh, messages we will do in this kind of mini series on basically how to kill sin. And look, I know one thing. I wish I could kill it. I wish I could kill it. But here's the question. Can I kill sin in any true meaningful way without killing the sinful nature? Like I, I can, I may be able to kill certain external manifestations of it, but we know theologically, even if I kill the external manifestation of it, Internally, I'm still committing sin. Now, the external manifestation may keep me out of trouble. That's good. But, and, and I may, and I may be able to pat myself on the back going, I've never done this and I've never done this and I've never done that. (laughs) But if I've committed all of those things internally, do I really get to pat myself on the back because I did not commit the external? Now, humanly speaking, I get to pat myself on the back, but I'm talking it from a theological perspective. So can I truly kill sin without killing the nature? And I can't kill the sinful nature because it's with me until glorification. So that raises lots of questions, but the Bible does talk about certain concepts. So we're going to listen to this. We're going to review it, analyze it, critique it, and not just, we're not just playing it. All right. We're, We're doing a review. And we're just going to, I don't know how, we may go 30 minutes, we may go 15 minutes, wherever I want to stop, we're going to stop, and then we will see. Maybe this series will generate the same type of discussion, and if it does, then maybe we'll do a little bit more. Maybe we'll go back and, and do part three for, you know, how to succeed, you know, how to be successful against your sin. Maybe, maybe we'll do that as well. If this is a subject that's generating some interest, then by all means, I mean, you know. And I, I'm doing this for everyone. I'm doing it for my benefit, but I'm also doing it for your benefit. So if we can all benefit from it, then by all means, we should do that. But are you ready to jump into this? All right. It's already 3.36 p.m. So like I said, the kids are out of school. I hear the dogs barking. They're out there having a great time. So while they're out there having a great time, we're going to have talk about the thing that causes us not to have such a great time. Well, I guess you could argue sometimes sin can cause us to have a great time. I don't know. Well, well, we know we know that sin ultimately usually brings negative consequences. So let's talk about, well, are there tools to kill it? Because if there's tools, I want those tools right now, right? I'm going to, I'm going to, they say five tools to kill sin. I got my pencils, which are, you know, the greatest tools. Here is pencil number one. Pencil number two, pencil number three, pencil number four, and pencil number five. These are going to serve as my visible, visible, 
visible representation of tools that will help me kill sin. I want to know what these five are because I want to carry them with me wherever I go because supposedly this is going to do it. Now, that's what I'm der deriving from the title. Remember in my reviews, I don't listen to them first, so I really don't know where this is going to go, but we're going to find out right now. Dear friends, we have been looking at the subject of the mortification of sin. That term mortification is a phrase that the scripture uses, which simply means to put to death. It means to kill. Sorry, to kill. The apostle Paul says we are to mortify or put to death sin. Okay, well, we've made it really far, haven't we? We've made it really far. Let's stop and spend the next 45 minutes <laughs> talking about the mortification of sin. All right, mortification of sin. Write that phrase down, mortification of sin. And let me ask you this. Do you think that there is a positional mortification and a practical mortification? In other words, positionally, sin has been mortified. It is done. It is complete. In Christ, I am I'm a new creature. The old is gone. All is new. That would mean mortification of the sin has, has taken place. I am holy. I am righteous. I am obedient. I am perfect. I am without sin and my position. But practically, so I think in one sense, there is a positional, a positional, if you think about it, positionally, I'm already sanctified. Practically, I'm being sanctified. Positionally, sin has been mortified. Practically, I am mortifying it. So I think that there is a positional and practical reality which Christians, I think, confound and confuse far more than they want to admit. They always want to act like the positional reality is their practical reality. And if you say that the positional reality is not the practical reality, they'll say, I've never heard someone describe such a weak Christianity in my life. That's pathetic. Christians can do this and they can do this and they can do this and they can do this. And it's like, the, the people who email me that stuff, it's like, you're talking such a big game, all right? Give me access to your life. I want to know what's going on in your mind. I want to know what's going on in your heart. I want to know what's going on one in the morning, three in the morning. I want to know because I guarantee you I would see sin, 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 sin. How come you can't just admit it? I'm not saying we should justify it. But here's some things about mortification. All right. Mortification of sin, according to one source, is the process of putting to death or subduing sinful desires and behaviors. All right. Okay. And I, and I think this is important. All right. So the Bible defines sin as any thought, word, or deed that goes against God's will and leads to separation from him. Sin is a universal problem that affects every human being. So I, and I would say this, sin is, we, we sin, we, we are, we have a sinful and depraved nature. That sinful and depraved nature then leads to thoughts, words, and deeds that go against God's will. In any way, shape, or form, and if we are not conformed perfectly to God's perfection, we have to be con in any way. Now, I want to make it clear, thought, word, and deed. But we are already in not in conformity to God's will, God's holiness, God's perfection in our nature. That that seems in all of these discussions that gets left out over and over and over. We all are already sinful before we do a sinful thing because we have a sinful nature. That sinful nature then leads to wrong thinking, wrong speaking, wrong doing, wrong desiring. All right? So I think that's very important. We have to kind of understand what we're talking about when we talk about sin. Now, the Bible teaches that sin is a serious issue that must be dealt with in the life of a believer. Sin separates us from God, hinders our relationship with him, and leads to spiritual bondage and death. 
All right, okay. Uh, The Bible acknowledges the power of sin in the life of a believer. Sin can manifest itself in various forms, such as pride, lust, greed, anger, selfishness, leading to destructive consequences. So yes, the Bible acknowledges that the power of sin is present in us. Where is the power of that sin coming from? From the nature, from the nature, the nature inside of you. It's the engine. It's the, it's the, it's the plant manufacturing all of it. Everything is flowing. The, the nature is just in there working 24-7, producing this desire and this and this and this and this and this and this and this. So many times when it comes to mortification, we start looking at all of the external symptoms. Well, by all means, we have to fight against the symptoms and try to help the symptoms, but the disease is not going away. Now, they, this article goes on to say the Holy Spirit plays a key role in the process of mortifying. He convicts believers of sin, empowers them to resist temptation, and enables them to live a life pleasing to God. This is immediately where I have my problem. This is where I get so totally confused with evangelical Christianity. If the Holy Spirit is empowering you to resist temptation, that's the Holy Spirit, third person of the Trinity, omnipotent God. If he's empowering me, I should be sinless. He, if, if I'm getting power from omnipotence, then I have the power of omnipotence, meaning then defeating sin shouldn't even be much of a problem. So they always want to say that the Holy Spirit uh, empowers us to resist temptation and then gives me the power to live a life pleasing to God. Well, guess what it requires to live a life pleasing to God? It would be perfection. So if it would be perfection, I'm never going to live a life pleasing to God because obviously the Holy Spirit is not giving me the power to get to perfection. So then you would have to say that you can live a life not perfect and still be pleasing to God. I will argue the way I live a life pleasing to God is because I live a life by faith. Therefore, by faith, I am in Christ Jesus and in Christ Jesus. I am pleasing to God in my position. Practically, my life is not always, never truly pleasing to God because sin is constantly present because I have a sinful nature. But Christianity loves to say, you've got the power. And then they always say, however, read the fine print. I mean, you can't get to sinlessness. You can't get to perfection, but you've got the power. Why is it that I have the power, but the power cannot get me to this level? Why is the power limited? And you say, well, you're limiting the power. You're telling me the power, I have the power to limit the power of omnipotent God? Then God's power is not omnipotent. Then they have, I think, tools for mortification. The Bible provides the, the the Bible provides believers with spiritual tools to help in the process of mortifying sin. Now, these are the tools they give. All right, here's what we're supposed to do to mortify our sin. We have to do, read our Bible. So here we go. We're going to go now. I don't know if what we're going to hear is going to give the same one. We have to read our Bible. All right. We have to fellowship with other believers. We have to have accountability and we have to have reliance on the power of the Holy Spirit. So the tools that they offer is read my Bible. If I read my Bible, now I can read my Bible all day. Now, yes, the Bible will show me what sin is. It will convict me of sin. So it may be helpful in my struggle with it. It's not going to eradicate the old nature and fellowship with other believers. That, how is that going to help me with my sin? Accountability? Well, wait, why do I need accountability if I have the power of omnipotent God g- giving me the power to resist temptation and the power to live a life pleasing to God? I don't need accountability. I've got God. So if I need accountability, meaning it seems to imply that there's an inherent weakness that I may need help with. And then I need reliance on the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, well, so... I, I, I don't know. I don't know what any of that, I don't know how any of that ultimately is going to help because even if you do all of those things, nobody is going to say you're going to get to spiritual, you're going to be sinless. So that means there's a limit even in those, those tools can't even get me to perfection. Let's, so there's a little bit about mortification. Let's see where they're going to take this. But something that I need to say to you, we have visitors here tonight and I would. I am not going to rehearse everything that has gone before. I think actually 
This is a half of the message from the last time. And I'm not going to take time to go through all of that that I uh, went, uh, went through the last time. But it is important for us to understand when we talk about sin, there's only one way to get rid of our sin. That's through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's through him only. You must first be, become a true Christian. Become born again of the Spirit of God. You must first be forgiven of your sins and to become a new person in the Lord Jesus Christ. So when he, the Apostle Paul talks about putting to death sin, you can't do it by yourself. You need the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a Oh boy. Okay. So I, I look, I do agree. We need Christ, but let me make it very clear. The way I deal with my sin and Christ is positionally because of an imputed righteousness. See, this is the same. This is, this is the, this is the, the setup. Now I'm not saying he's an explicitly saying this, but it feels like this is the direction he's ha- he's going because this is just typical in the evangelical fundamentalist world of Christianity. It's just, this is the way it shows up, right? Here's how it works. See, you see your, yourself over there, you lost person. You can't fight against your sin. You can't overcome sin. You're lost. You're helpless. You can't do anything. But dun, 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 if you get Jesus, you got the power. You got the power. You can do it. So we as Christians supposedly have the power that nobody else does. But I don't know. I've seen atheists who live very strict lives of self-discipline, and they abstain from this and this and this and this and this and this. I've seen, I've worked with Muslims who are very disciplined. They pray at the the hour of prayer, wherever they are, whatever they're doing. They abstain from this and they don't do this and they don't do this and they don't do that. I have known very committed Catholics who do this and do this and don't do this. I've seen commit, I've worked with committed Mormons who don't do this and 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 don't do this. And I've worked with Christians who have done this and this and this and this and don't seem to have the same discipline and they seem to be falling and struggling in with sin all the time. Now, I know the go to play, I know the card that ever, if you say that, they're like, well, those people aren't true Christians. Christians. Those people aren't true Christians. If if, if if you know a Christian who is struggling with sin and f- falling and doing more than, than p- people who are Muslims or Catholics or Mormons, then they weren't a true Christian. So what we do, it's the way we fix our problem, is anyone who doesn't live up to the standard that we think they're supposed to live up, we just throw them out of the body of Christ as if somehow we're God. But no, believers sin. It's always like we get superpowers. We get special powers. 2,000 years of church history, the church fights and we split and there's bitterness and animosity and people are, they don't want to give and they don't want to help and they're not generous and they're not loving and they're bitter and they backbite and they gossip and they slander. And that's just your average Sunday, adult Sunday school class. Come on. Why do we always want to pretend that we, you get Jesus, you get the power. No, in Jesus, your sins are dealt with. You know how they're dealt with? Positionally, because of imputed righteousness. Isn't it amazing that the entire Protestant Reformation was a battle between imputed and infused righteousness. Roman Catholicism taught infused righteousness and the Protestant Reformation taught imputed righteousness. But yet, when you listen to Christians always talk about things, it's as if we are infused and they almost forget our positional standing and the idea that our salvation is based off an imputed righteousness, meaning that we're still sinners, but we're declared to be something that we're not. First of all, you need life from God. And so the Apostle Paul, he says in Colossians chapter 3, for example, for ye are dead. What does that mean? Spiritually, you died. Your old man has gone. So you have to ask yourself, have I died? Has, has, has God caused me to spiritually die to my old self, my old life? And am I now living? Has God given me by his grace new life in the Lord Jesus Christ? Can I say, and your life is hid with Christ in God? Now, here's the thing. Hey, basically, look, you can't do this without without Jesus. How do you know you have Jesus? Well, you're dead 
You're dead. Your old life is dead. You died. Now, if I'm dead, if the old me is dead, that would seem to imply that practically then, because he seems to be inferring this is a practical reality, that then practically I'm dead to sin. The old man is completely dead. Well, then why do we sin? Let me make it clear. I am dead positionally. Practically, the old man is very much alive. It is dead, but not dead. I'm sanctified, but not sanctified. I'm saved, but being saved. There is two realities. I don't know why the evangelical world cannot comprehend this. I'm a new creature. The old is gone and everything is new, but then I'm not new and the old is still present because one is positional, one is practical. I am dead, completely dead in Christ. I've been crucified positionally. In Christ, I am dead. The old is gone. I, am I, I have been crucified with Christ. That is positional, 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 practical. I'm not crucified. I'm still roaming about. Now, I have to try to then put into practice what is true positionally. The Christian life is the never-ending and never truly successful practice of trying to live out practically what is true positional. It is within that context that the apostle says that then you, when you are a Christian, then you ought to mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Now stop right there. You just said I'm dead. If I'm dead, then what do I need to mortify? I'm dead positionally. Practically, I have to try to mortify. That I don't, like, sometimes Christians say things and it's so confusing. Like, they, they'll talk about, you're a new creature, you're, you're, you're dead. And they talk about it as practically. And then they turn around like, you've got to do this and you've got to do this. and you, I don't have to do anything if you, what you just described is true practically. So, so you have to then acknowledge all those things you just described are true positionally. Now, practically, now I've got a fight on my hand. Because now I have a practical reality that doesn't match the positional reality. And he goes on to speak of the various types of sin in Colossians 3 and verse 5. And this is teaching you, if you are a Christian, that you are in a spiritual battle. Every Christian is at war to the death, we could say. Why are we in a battle? Because we still have, we still have a sinful nature. See, he's re, he's borrowing from Colossians chapter three, right? So look in verse three, for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Positional reality. When Christ, who is also our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. That is a, because of my positional reality, that I'm dead and my life is hid with Christ and God, when he appears, I will be with him based off my positional reality. Nothing can touch that positional reality. Now, there's the positional reality. Now, the practical reality. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanliness, and uh, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Those are the things I must fight against. Why? Because that's that's not my positional reality. See, my, my positional reality, I'm dead. My life is hid. Therefore, I'm guaranteed eternity. Practically, man, I got to mortify my members. I got to try to fight. I got to fight this. I got to fight, 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 fight. No matter how humble or simple that person may be, he's fighting against principalities and powers and resisting uh, all sorts of things, starting from within us. Okay, good, good, good. I was just getting ready to interrupt. And say he's focusing on the external, but he started. It, it's it's within us. You're right. The problem is within us. What is still within us? The sinful nature. Meaning then, I'm not dead. Meaning the sinful nature is very much alive. You've got to learn to note the difference between positional and practical. The problem is still inside of me. Meaning not everything is new. 
meaning that the old is still there, meaning the old is not dead, meaning the old has not been crucified. Positionally, it has, but not practically. And then the, the, the satanic attacks from outside and temptations and this world as well. And so we've been looking at that. And the last time when we thought about this subject of killing sin and putting sin to death, we, we said last time, and first of all, what morti- mortifying uh, remaining sin is not. If you remember that, that we talked about, well, it talks about mortification of sin, but looking at it negatively, what it isn't. And we said that, uh, number one, mortification is not the eradication of sin. It's not getting rid of sin altogether. When the Apostle Paul says to kill sin, he's not talking about the fact that it's going to be all gone in your lifetime. No. Okay, so he just admitted. Mortification is not eradication. We fight to kill it, but we're never going to get rid of it. Meaning, I want to make it very clear. He just acknowledged mortification of sin is a situation you will never experience true victory or true success. You will have victories, but you will never have true victory because he himself admitted you, it's, ne- it's, never, it's, it's, it's never ending. It's never ending. Now, I don't know if the average Christian is prepared to hear that. Hey, I come to Christ and what's going to happen? You're going to now enter into a battle with your flesh and you are never going to have complete victory over it. You are going to sin and you're 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 going to sin. Well, at least everyone in, in Christianity will agree with that. No, they will not. They will, they will pick up a rock and bash it across your head, not literally, metaphorically speaking, and call you a sinner and want to brand you with a letter because they expect you to be perfect. Or at least they expect you not to commit the sins on the list. Whatever that list is, don't, as long as you can, now you can commit these sins and you'll be good and you can come to the potluck and you can come to the church fellowship and you can have donuts with me and you can, you can drink coffee and we're great. But if you commit these sins, oh, ho, 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 stone the heathen crucifixion at midnight. But the pro- pro- problem is that denies the very reality that he literally, he just articulated, which is you're, you're never going to eradicate it. It's never going to be gone, meaning sin will be in the life of every believer all through their life. The church seems not to know how to process that reality. We spend all of our time pretending that is not the case. We spend all of our time putting on fig leaves and robes of self-righteousness to make ourselves appear to be something that we're not. It's not going to be destroyed. This indwelling sin is not going to be destroyed to the point that you say it doesn't uh, it doesn't remain any longer. There are, there are some people who call themselves Christians and they believe that they don't sin anymore. And that goes right against what the Apostle John says and and other scriptures. And I, I mentioned those the last time. And then we, we talked about the fact that mortification of sin is not the same thing as diverting sin and we talked about this that there are some people who say well I, i've dealt with this issue let's say with some kind of an addiction but then they fall into other things and, and so they think that since they they have this this thing has been diverted now they have killed sin no and it's not about changing one's behavior through a fear of discovery some people say well well i don't do these things but the issue is they are just not doing those things because they're fearful. They'll be found out. And, and they've been threatened. Like a child who says, the parent says, well, if you take that biscuit, if you come in, in the kitchen and, and you take the stuff that is not yours, then, the, then the, some, there, is, there are consequences. And so the child doesn't do it, not because they, uh, they're a good boy or a good girl. No, or, or that they're obedient. They're just fearful of the... Uh, whatever implement the parents may use. Now that, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, now this is interesting. So mortification is not diverting. Hey, I stopped this sin, but now I got this other. 
Now, I think a lot of Christianity is diverting, right? Hey, before I became a Christian, I used to go out to the club. I used to get drunk. I used to get stoned. I used to do it. But now I don't do any of that anymore. But now your life is filled with, I don't know, now you gossip, you slander, you judge, you condemn, you're arrogant, you're, you're self-conceited. You're, you're, you, you, I mean, and that, you just sometimes just change one sins to another. Christians never catch on to that. You didn't really mortify anything. You just changed the sins you were committing. You were committing the sins that were acceptable in the club, and now you've, you've, tra- you've changed those sins to the sins that are acceptable within the church. You didn't do anything. You just changed your sins. He says, that's not mortification. And then listen to that. Mortification is not simply uh, obeying out of a sense of fear. I wonder how much obedience happens in the life of a believer simply because you don't want to get caught. Simply because you don't want church discipline. Simply because you don't want your kids to find out or your parents or or your spouse. I wonder how much of our obedience is simply because, oh, I don't want to get caught. I don't want to get caught. I'm not going to do this. I don't want to get caught. He's saying that that's not mortification. Well, I I agree because none of that is focused on, I want to please God. No, no, no. It's all focused on a very earthly, fleshly way of looking at it. And I think the church constantly looks at sin and all of this in a very fleshly way. But we were so proud of ourselves because we don't commit that sin and whatever that sin is. But we're committing all of our own. So we said this, what, what it isn't, what mortification of sin, this remaining sin is not. But then secondly, we said what is what it is, what is putting to death this remaining sin. And we said, and I'm just giving you the outline of what we talked about last time from this passage and many other texts in scripture was that mortification or putting sin to death is being engaged in an inward war with our, with our flesh. I so agree with it. It's an inward war. It's an inward war. It's inward. It's it's the wars inside. I, I I talked about this before. Our our, you know, when when we're when we talk about spiritual warfare, everyone almost wants to go to this Hollywood version where we're casting out demons and we're and we're fighting against all of the. We're going to go against the government and we're it, no. Spiritual warfare is a battle that begins inside of you. That's the front lines. That's where the battle is. Your battle is inside of you. You're engaged in a war with your very nature. This this fighting our daily sins, the refusal to allow the eyes to wander, the the fingers and and the, the, the... the heart and the feet and the tongue and the ears and the eyes to wander, for our affections to, uh, to run after things which draws us from the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, I'm talking about, this is talking about Christians. So there is this engagement in, in an inward war with the flesh then we talked about that mortification or killing sin is being engaged in a battle everywhere with sin not just about one particular thing and and some of us we think well my issue is just this issue if i could get rid of this issue then i'll be all right but i don't realize that this issue is linked to another issue and it's, it's all linked together and oftentimes we, when you get to the bottom of it, it has to do with me my pride is the big issue. So we need to deal with the whole person. We need to deal with my whole life. That's what I need to deal with. I need my whole life to be, be changed and to be sanctified. And, and sin affects every part of me. And, and I, I have to stop here and actually discuss what I want to discuss with you tonight, rather than going through the previous one. Uh, and uh, I want you to, to listen, if you um, uh, have not heard the previous message, to listen to, to that message. And the central theme through all of these messages is that we are called to mortify 
the deeds, the sins, the sinful deeds of the body. But only through Christ you can achieve that and the power of the Holy Spirit. It is. Now, once again, he says, you can, you can't, uh, you can only achieve this through Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. No, but no, 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 no. I can't truly achieve it because you've already acknowledged that it's no total victory. So when you say that I can achieve this through the power of God, why is the power of God limited in what I can achieve? That's the question nobody ever wants to answer. Hey, we can achieve this through the power of the Holy Spirit and Christ. I mean, you can't really achieve it. You can only, I can only do what? I can only do what? No, they can't, they never measure out exactly how much success I can have, but they clearly tell you, you can't have ultimate success. But, but yet at the same time, I'm supposedly receiving this power from God, which is omnipotent power, but this omnipotent power won't get me only so far. Well, if I can only get so far and nobody can get to perfection, then why do we in a sense, lose our minds when people then demonstrate that lack of perfection by committing certain sins. You're like, well, you committed that sin. That's the end. You, well, why? Why? They're going to commit sin. You're like, well, you can commit all of these sins. You cannot. What we should just say is, hey, listen, these sins you can commit. These are the four. If you commit them, that's it. It's the end. It's the end of your ministry. It's the end of this. You're going to be church disciplined. You're going to be public humiliated. You're going to be shamed. There's going to be articles on the Christian post. People are going to be talking about it on X and people are going to be talking about it on TikTok. These are the ones you can't commit. And then we can just acknowledge that all these other ones, it's a free for all. And we say, well, no, we would never say that. But that's the truth. Think of how many sins happen in your church all the time. No one is ever church disciplined for them. Pride, arrogance, bitterness, unforgiveness, gossip, slander, not loving people, a lack of generosity. But then you, you there's a line and you're like, oh, that will get you in trouble. And it, it's so subjective. Again, I've talked about it before. Two, you can have four teenagers in the church. Four teenagers. One is a boy and a girl. They're engaged in premarital sex fornication. Right? Now, that could lead to some kind of church discipline. It could. All right? It could. All right? But it's happening. Right? So it may lead to some kind of problem. But let me tell you, if the other two teenagers are of the same sex and they are found out to be in a relationship? <laughs> oh boy. Oh boy. That's going to blow. That's going to be the end of it all. Uh, no, how dare. Wait a minute. The other two are engaged. Well, that's, that's okay because that's kind of what's supposed to happen. Wait, wait. The Bible says that it's not. So this will be over. And then while you're going after the two teenagers who may be engaged in a same-sex relationship, you may even be going after the teenagers who are engaged in a fornication. You'll have people in your church who are married, got divorced, got remarried, possibly then meeting the biblical definition of an adulterous relationship because that now remarriage is now adulterous. And guess what? They won't get in any trouble. In fact, they'll be sitting there taking the Lord's Supper and everything will be good. Well, wait a minute. Why are some people in trouble? Some people not in trouble. And then we say that we have the power to overcome it. Well, clearly we don't have the power to overcome it perfectly. It's just a subjective mess and nobody stops to go, we got to rethink this. Even he has acknowledged you're never going to get victory. But then he turns around and says, but you're going to do this by the power of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. But then you've already told me that that power can't get me to the ultimate victory. So then how do I understand power that's gre greatly limited? Hey, this so this power can get me where? 20% better? 30% better? 50% better? 60% better? And you say, well, that's a ridiculous question to ask. No, it's not. If the power is limited, I need to then set my expectations that I cannot ever get. He's already set my expectations. You're not getting to sinlessness. You're not getting to perfection. Okay. That means even with the power of God, I'm going to continue to sin. Therefore, then the expectation for everyone in the church is, hey, we're all going to sin. 
And I don't think that's the, ex- I think the expectation in the church is we're all going to sin, but this, and we have a undefined list of the sins that you cannot commit. Because if you commit those, you will be church disciplined and you will be publicly humiliated. These others are okay. It is impossible for you to put sin to death only through Christ. See, it's impossible for you to put sin to death, but you can through Christ. Now, wait, if I can put sin to death through Christ, you've already told me I can't truly eradicate it. So I can put, maybe, are you saying I can put specific sins to death? Okay, so I can get some sins to death, but I can't get all sin to death. All right, so then how many sins can I get put to death? Can I get five? Can I get 10? Can I get 15? Because you yourself have acknowledged there's a limitation. That, like I, when I ask these questions, people think I'm trying to be difficult. People think I'm just trying to be. No, I'm asking the question that I think everyone in the pew, they ask themselves when preachers preach this, they just never say anything. I think everyone leaving the church when they hear messages like this are asking these exact same questions, or at least I always was. But let me now give you a number of um tools, scriptural tools, to, uh, to effectual mortification. Tools that the scripture says, things that the Christian ought to uh, have right in, in their toolbox, as it were, to deal with, with matter of daily, daily sin. And there, there, we could say five things, and in future messages there will be other things, but if we can even go through the five. But the first one, what is the first thing? Your, your daily temptations, the daily attacks from within, from without. The first thing is to, to recognize it and say no. Learn. So your first tool is to recognize it as sin and say no. <laughs> All right. So I, I, I can't overcome it completely, but I can overcome it some. And the way I overcome it is by just recognizing and saying, no, no. Now, look, I do agree that there's lots of things that we can do that if we would recognize it and say no to it, we probably could do much better than we, we, we pretend. But once again, most of the time what this would mean, I can say no to a lot of things externally. Now, I don't... Look, I may be the only one. Sometimes I feel like, because I, a lot of times my emails are very, <laughs> they get really quiet when we talk about some of these subjects. So I'm, maybe the rest of you are much more godly than me, and that's great. I, look, congratulations, you figured it out. You need to write a book. But for me, this is what I found out. A lot of times I'm very good at recognizing. I, I recognize all the time when I've committed a sin. I know it. There's no question about it. I'm not going to deny it. I know. But I, here's what I know. Typically, when I say no, it means I've said no to an external act. But let me tell you something. I've committed the act 5,000 different ways internally. And I know you're going to be like, oh, oh, give me a break. There's been times, I, I don't know about you, when I was in the United States military, there would be times I would work with people or maybe a boss and I would get so ticked off because something was going on and I wanted to say something or I wanted to throw something and I wanted to be furious and I said no, but I walked away. But inside, oh man, inside I was saying this and inside I was throwing things across the room and inside I was saying I quit and I'm never coming back and inside I, I, and I ran to Canada and I'm like, come get me, I'm never going back. Like inside, I who knows all the things I committed. Oh, come on. I bet you you've done that even with your spouse. You've gotten so mad before that you may externally walked away, but inside you wanted to choke them. You wanted inside, you wanted to tell them that you are leaving and never coming back. Now, external, you didn't do that. So yes. So what I want to say is it's great that external, we say no, but rarely do we ever are able to say no internally because it's already there. It's just, it's it, before we even know it's our, I've already said it and thought it and did it internally. So it's great that we say no, 
But I just want you to know, philologically, <laughs> you're still in sin. And from the grace of God to say no to ungodliness. Mortification is, is a subject that has to be taught to every disciple in the school of Christ. It's on the syllabus, we could say. And it can't be removed. It's there alongside other subjects that the Christian learns, uh, like truth and like repentance and like prayer and worship and stewardship and bearing witness to the faith. Those, those things that we ought to be growing in. That's what the disciple is. They're learning more and more and more. And none of these activities is picked up by some kind of a religious sort of inhalation. Simply because I I am a Christian, I am going to somehow, these things will be infused into me. No, that's why we have the scriptures. That's why we have the word of God. That's why we are to follow Christ in these things, growing Christ in these things. And so I have to preach sermons and ministers have to preach sermons to you from the word of God about all of these subjects. And there is no, no one who doesn't need to learn about mortification. And, and you look at, you go and see a psychiatrist. You go and see some kind of a psychologist of this world. And, and uh, they, they might have some helpful things to talk about. But at best, dear friends, the best of psychiatry is an echo of the Bible, of the Word of God. And so we need to steep ourselves in the Word of God. The Scriptures have the answers. The Scriptures are sufficient, and our need is to study it and understand the the implications, the practical implications. For example, the Apostle Paul tells Titus uh, what is one of the great lessons uh, of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ into the world. It teaches everybody. What is one of the things, and this is related to saying no to things. It's a simple thing, but this is what the Apostle Paul says. In Titus chapter 2, Verses 11 and 12 is very relevant to our subject tonight. Where the Apostle Paul says in Titus 2, verse 11 and 12, he says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust. So it's, this is what's teaching us. This, the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ has come, he's revealed himself, The fact that we have the gospel preached to us, this gospel of salvation that brings salvation, this has appeared in in this world, and this is what's teaching us to say no. It says denying ungodliness. It's telling you, it's teaching you to deny ungodliness, to say no. I don't want to follow this ungodly thought, ungodly life, and worldly lusts. And then it says, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So it's t- the fact that Jesus Christ has come to the Christian, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness, to no to uh, these worldly lusts or worldly passions, and to live in a, in a self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present world. Now I'll stop right there because we're at 53 minutes. Um, I'm going to write this the time down, 32.13. Now, I want you to go find that sermon on the Sermons 2.0 app, Five Tools to Kill Your Sin, Part 1 and Part 2. Now, the Part 1 is not na- uh, labeled Part 1, uh, but they did a Part 2. So, yeah, But Five Tools to Kill Your Sin, find it. It's on the Sermons 2.0 app. You should be able to find it. And... Uh, Okay, I'm writing all that down. And uh, go listen to it. I want you to think it long and hard. It's just crazy that the first tool is just say no. Just say no. But he's already acknowledged there's a limit to what you can say no to. Because if you could just say no, you could get to perfection. So clearly saying no 
can't get you to perfection. So there's a limit to what you can say no to. So how do you, how do you implement an idea that the tool to stop, to kill sin is to say no to it when you already have acknowledged that you can't say no to it all. Now that means I'm not saying you shouldn't say no to any of it. You should, we should say no to as much as we can, but no, I, but also we have to at least acknowledge from a, a, this is very important theologically saying no to it typically means you're saying no to an external thing. Now you may say no to like you get an internal thought or an internal desire and, and you say no to it in a sense to keep it from turning into action. That's wonderful. But just note that in many cases you've already committed the sin internally. Now, it doesn't mean excuse it. I'm just saying we have to at least acknowledge the reality of how frequently we fall short. Why? Because the reality of how frequently we fall short and how we're never going to pull this off makes you and me have to run to one place, the cross, kneel before the cross, be washed in the blood, and remember that his obedience is imputed to us by faith alone. That is my only hope because everything else is going to leave me discouraged, despairing, and giving up. Yes, we should say no. I'm not, I'm not, by no means am I saying don't say no. Say no. But it's not that easy. Because you've already acknowledged that there's a limit to what we can say no to. We can say no, 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 no. Clearly, we're going to keep sinning because if we could just simply say no and stop sinning, then we would get to sinless perfection. But everyone, he just acknowledged and everyone, I think reasonably, acknowledges that we can't stop. So therefore, you're saying no has a limit. It's not enough, it's not sufficient to get you to sinlessness. It may get you to sin less in many cases externally. All right. So the first one is we need to, re- now we do need, he didn't talk a lot about recognizing it. We do need to recognize it. We do need to recognize what sin is. We, we do need to be willing to say, Hey, look, I may not want to admit this, but yeah, that's sin. I may not want to admit that. That's it. Yeah. That's a sinful thought. We, we have to be willing to admit it. And then we have to try to say no to it. Now, guess what? We're not always going to say no to it. And even if we say no to it, like I said, so many times I may say no to the external, but I, I mean, like, it, I would be a liar to admit that, to, to try to claim that I haven't already committed the sin internally. But what some people, some Christians are okay with it. Hey, you commit that sin internally, that's okay. Just don't let it come out because if it comes out, then we have to, you know, we have to go get the rocks and we have to get the cross ready and we have to get the hammers and nails ready because then we have to do something. Well, that's kind of like a weird approach. All right, we'll stop there. Please go look those up. Please, 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 please go look those up. Five tools to kill your sin. Please go listen to all of them. Listen to, let me know what you think about what you hear. Look these sermons up on Sermons 2.0, all right? Use the, use the app today. Use it tomorrow, all right? Uh, this is, uh, again, a part of our Sermons 2.0 app challenge. I know we're supposed to be in the Minor Prophets. I know we're supposed to be talking about Ash Wednesday for the liturgical calendar and the lectionary. I know we're uh, we're supposed to be talking about the minor prophets for our 21 days in the minor prophets. I know we've got so, there's always so much, but just add this to your list and uh, I'll see what you can can do so. And then depending on, well, we'll we'll at least do a little bit more because I've got to hear, look, I've got to hear the five tools because, and I'm not joking. If there's tools, I want to know the tools so that I can use them. And the first tool is, I'm supposed to say, that that's a sin? No. Just say no. It reminds me of the, the 1980s, you know, the, the, the war on drugs. Just say no. I don't know if you realize that. It didn't work. You can email me, newsif at yahoo.com. That's newsif at yahoo.com. Please remember, this podcast is supported by you, the listener. If you want it on the air, then support. If you don't, then don't. If we don't have the support, it goes away. That's that's the way it's going to work moving forward. You can always support us by going to theologycentral.net, hit the donate tab, theologycentral.net, uh, or on the Church One app or the Sermons 2.0 app, there's a little tab there called Give. $1, $2, $5, $6, $3, whatever you want to give, whatever you think a message is worth, then please 
do that. Thank you. Have a great day. Have a great evening. It is Valentine's, but don't forget, it's Ash Wednesday. So I don't, how do you, how do you balance that? I don't know. What do you do with that? I don't know. I, that you, most will probably just think about Valentine's and forget that it's Ash Wednesday. I don't know what you do with that. I don't know. Hey, honey, let's, let's go out for a Valentine's day. I, I mean, well, it is Ash Wednesday, so maybe we should sit in sackcloth and ashes. And okay. All right. All right I don't know. How do you balance it? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. All right. Y'all have a great night. Thanks for listening. God bless.